subscribe. I have a couple issues with this one that prevented me from enjoying it as much as everyone else seems to. I played this game as my first full Mega Man experience. I had tried out a couple of the mainline series games, none of them were really for me, but I was determined to play this one all the way through. First off, I want to mention the issue I have with all Mega Man games, since this is a core element of their design, that is, the difficulty. Now wait, I don't have an issue with the games being hard. I enjoy a good challenge, but what makes Mega Man different is that you can choose from any of the eight main stages to start from, any one. Seems cool on paper, but while playing X, I found it to be more problematic than anything else. For one, this option means that the difficulty curve can be all over the place depending on what you pick, because despite what you think with an option like this, not all stages are created equal. I put this game down multiple times because I wanted to pick a robot master that ended up being a terrible option to start with, like Storm Eagle for example. Now, the logical option then is to pick a different stage that'll be a little easier, like Chill Penguin. But now I ask you this, if there is an intended order for these stages, then why give us the illusion of an open choice? If I didn't eventually give up and look at a guide, I might have been ramming my head against the wall for many more hours on end before I got anywhere, and no better for it. Seriously, in-game guides are good and we shouldn't exclude them. This issue unfortunately soured my whole whole experience, and the cherry on top was that this game was still hard no matter what you did. But honestly, I can deal with the challenging level if at least I know I'm making progress. And yeah, I abused the hell out of safe states. Now I must admit, there is still a lot to enjoy here. Fully upgraded X is actually kinda fun to play X. It was still tough as nails, but it felt doable. A lot of the bosses were quite fun to pin down and defeat. That feeling of learning as you fight them was really enjoyable. Safe states definitely helped this because I'd be damned if I had to trudge through the proceeding level again after a game over. The presentation is also really, really good. It really looks like an evolution of Mega Man, and it still stands on its own quite well. Need I even mention the music? Some of the best energetic music in gaming, period. This one clashed hard with me. This clearly isn't my type of game, but I must admit it's mostly, mostly well made. Maybe you'll like it. This one isn't really that involved. Pilot Wings feels more like a tech demo pretty cool tech demo, but a tech demo nonetheless, and so I felt less required to actually finish this one. But I still made sure to try out all the different game modes there were to try. I sucked at it, but it felt like a neat collection of mini games to sink my teeth into between huge games. Nothing in here really stood out to me, that's what happens when you make a game to show off technical capabilities like this, eventually they age. Graphics are pretty nice, but because this whole game uses the SNES's stretch and distort features, things can get muddy at times. It's what made me mess up most of the time. The music was okay as well, nothing crazy, but enough to keep that energy up with a slight bounce. There's not a lot here, but what is here is nice, if just for a distraction. Not much more to say. Six out of ten! I should come right out and say that sim games aren't really my forte. They're just not the type of game that I'm generally good at, but I still had some nice experiences with SimCity. I came in expecting a really simple rendition of a city builder, but I was surprised at the amount of complexity that was in this game. They still have a lot of the systems that make a game like this today, and it was fun to mess around with on a 16-bit screen. It also gives me a very cozy feeling that I find hard to put into words. Maybe it's the pleasant music, the slower pace, the simple graphics, or a combination of all of them. For a while, whenever I felt in need of comfort, I would boot up SimCity and mess around in the sandbox for a little while, or start a new city and admire the possibilities. That being said, the major issue for me was that it never really held my attention for very long. My sessions were usually short and infrequent. Truth be told, I don't remember much about this game beyond what I've already said. There was always something more interesting to play on the horizon, and SimCity was just a way to recharge. Street Fighter is a series that I had wanted to get into for a while, and for some reason I was hell-bent on starting with Street Fighter 2. It just looked like the most interesting to me, and the least intimidating in comparison. When I finally got around to playing it, I had a blast through a lot of it. It was tough but not undoable, and I felt motivated to keep playing through the losses. The different characters allowed me to try different playstyles, which I appreciated, although I mostly just stuck with Ryu. Most of my time with this game was through the single player. The multiplayer I did get to play was fun 
one, but exacerbated one of the problems I had, that being the SNES controller. Now, this isn't entirely the fault of the game, but it must be said that Street Fighter 2 was not meant to be played with the SNES controller. Doing inputs felt like a struggle and a gambling game in itself. While in single player, I could get used to it and keep playing, multiplayer was not as fun as it should have been for this reason. I'm not sure what could have been done, but something to accommodate for bringing the arcade over to the SNES would have been greatly appreciated. Instead, it felt like they crammed all they could onto the SNES and put their hands up. It works, but it doesn't feel great to play. The other main issue I had is that this game is slow. Very slow for a fighting game. This is after all the base version of Street Fighter 2. I know future releases would up the pace, but I was not lucky enough to come across Championship Edition when I walked into the retro game store that day. Lastly, I must admit I didn't actually get all the way through this one. I stopped after I lost a Balrog for the 50th time, because at that point the controls and pace were really starting to get to me. It's unfortunate, but I enjoy most everything else about this game. The graphics look great for this system and are still nice to play. The character list, while small, does have a decent amount of variety in gameplay styles. The music is iconic, and the game can be enjoyed by beginners and veterans. Seven out of ten. Super Metroid's reputation precedes itself at this point. It's hard to go around the gaming community on the internet and not stumble into somebody praising this game. After finally playing it for myself, I can see what everyone is talking about. The atmosphere fills the screen wherever you go. The feeling of opening up the map, discovering new areas and secrets and old ones is wonderful. And it's all driven by the fun power-ups. I also really like the slightly more hidden techniques like the wall jump and shine spark. It opens up the gameplay possibilities tremendously. There were times where I started to get frustrated by an obstacle, but I remembered if I used a well-placed wall jump, I could bypass it. It saved a lot of those moments for me. It also surprised me just how much content there is in this game. The way the four main bosses are spread out and the cleverly placed gates around the map means you never return to an old area the same way. The game ends up being much bigger than I anticipated for a game of this generation. I like how you're rewarded for backtracking by returning to an area with a new power-up and using it to get a missile upgrade or an e-tank. It never felt too stale or confusing, most of the time. There are some points where the way forward isn't exactly clear. Super Metroid has a habit of hiding rooms behind unassuming walls or blocks. Most of the time, it's optional, but there are a couple instances where it isn't, and I remember wasting so much time wandering around because I forgot to shoot the one block in the corner of the room. This leads me to mention the map. I like the map in this game for the most part, but towards the end of the game, it can turn into a mess of Tetris blocks and dots. My main gripe is that the doors aren't labeled, so rooms next to each other on the map may not actually be connected. It makes getting lost so much worse. Lastly, the controls are something I never really got used to. They aren't awful, but the floaty physics and the limited button scheme hinders the flow for me. Having to spam the select button to get the item I want is a terrible idea. But I still ended up really loving this game. What it lacks in some aspects of design, controls, and layout, it more than makes up for in atmosphere, visuals, music, fun power-ups, and a huge playground ground to soak it all up in. Punch-Out is not so much a fighting game as it is a puzzle or even a rhythm game to me. The crux of this game is figuring out your opponent's patterns and responding with the correct sequence in order to knock them out. It's one of the main reasons I find it so satisfying when you defeat someone. It scratches that perfectionist itch since the further you go, the more specific the timings get and the less chances you get to mess up. From the fighting game point of view, I actually find it kind of disappointing because you don't have a lot of options or freedom to express your playstyle. You only get a directional dodge, a low punch, punch and a high punch. You don't even really move around the ring on your own. Super Punch-Out does have the KO punch meter, which I think is a nice reward for playing consistently, but there isn't much to say beyond this in terms of gameplay. It's a very simple game. It focuses hard on this one idea and evolves it as the game goes on, but at some point it felt to me that it just became about stricter timing. That's when it got stale to me. There wasn't anything new being showcased that made me want to keep playing, so while I do really enjoy Super Punch-Out from time to time, I haven't been able to stick with it all the way through. Nothing made me want to power through that last batch of boxers because I didn't feel like I'd get to experience anything worth the trial and error. Six out of ten. Right on. Man, this was something else. Super Star Wars was a pain in the ass to play, but still somehow really fun, and I couldn't exactly put my finger on why. For starters, it's very unforgiving. Yes, I use save states for this too. 
Even still, I had to play on easy mode because outside of that, I couldn't get past the first level. That's because the enemies in this game are pretty bad. They will be thrown at you with no mercy, and yes, they will respawn if you run away and come back. By far my least favorite part of retro game design. What makes it worse is that they are so frequent and that you never really get a chance to breathe. You are forced to power through everything because if you think for a second that you want to retreat and collect yourself, you're just going to make it so much worse. Now, why did I end up liking this game at the end of the day? Simple. The control and gameplay is actually pretty well done. Shooting feels responsive, and you can aim in eight directions, which is a godsend to deal with some enemies in this game. I also like the lightsaber when you get it later on. While the levels aren't anything to write home about, the locales are pretty fun to explore. The first level is pretty boring, but eventually you get to explore the cantina, jump along the rooftops, shooting stormtroopers, and infiltrate the Death Star. The game loosely follows the story of A New Hope, and I like how it follows the main beats but deviates to provide more interesting levels. The graphics look fine during gameplay, but the cutscenes and those speeder sections aren't so hot, especially those travel sections. Things can be incredibly hard to read, and if it weren't for the guides on screen, I'd be so lost. Still, I can say I liked this one. It helps that it wasn't too long, otherwise the insane difficulty would have really gotten to me. Seven out of ten. Yeah, it looks best.